What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And in this video, I'm going to add a space station to my space agency's arsenal of ships in orbit, which is actually a figure of zero, come to think of it. I have no space stations or surface bases anywhere on this save file that changes today. And I thought now that we've finished unlocking the tech tree and I'm no longer bound by my rule of no use of DLC, I'm going to go basically the other end of that spectrum and rely very heavily on the new breaking ground robotic parts and construct a stock rotating ring space station. I've built a stock rotating ring space station before, all the way back in the ancient times of 2018. But uh, that was before we had stock rotors. It was kind of janky, really. It, used, it was basically two separate crafts that were kind of connected to each other and the ring would rotate under its own SAS power. But now we can do things, quote unquote, properly. So I'm showing the time lapse of me constructing the station itself here. Haven't constructed the rings yet, as the more observant among you may have noticed. Just in here on screen, you can see me constructing some escape pods. So the escape pods have a capacity of uh, four kerbals per pod, which brings our station's capacity to 16 kerbals if we, you know, care about having them all uh, able to evacuate safely. Now, here you can see me constructing the first rotating ring for this space station. Uh, my initial design for this station only consisted of one rotating ring, much like the one I built back in 2018. However, the issue is that the ring is going to be physically attached to the station via an electric rotor, which means at least in space, when we fire up the rotor, there will not only be a rotational force exerted onto the ring itself, but an inverse rotating force will be exerted onto the rest of the station too. Basically, what this means is that when we rotate the ring one way, the station will want to rotate the other way. And, you know, we don't want it to rotate at all. Now, there are ways to mitigate this. My first plan was just to have two rotors powering the rings, one going in the opposite direction to the other, and that would balance out, but it didn't seem to work all that well. There's also the option of limiting the RPM and torque of the ring, but that might result in too slow a spin speed. There is also the option of adding lots and lots of reaction wheels to the station that we want to remain still, but this would consume a lot of power, and with KSP's janky physics easing and how it handles ships not in direct player control, this really isn't an ideal solution either. However, if we install a second ring that rotates in the opposite direction to the other, the two effectively cancel each other out, and it keeps the core of the station fixed and stationary. Now you can see I built the station rings at the end of the station and then used the offset tool to move them into their actual correct location. The main reason for this is that it means we can hide the rotor inside those fairing pieces and make it more believable that a Kerbal could transfer directly from the rings into the station itself rather than needing to do an EVA, which is what the reality would realistically be. You know, they can't to transfer through an electric motor. <laughs> so there we have our habitat rings. I'm guessing most of you will know the purpose of having rings that spin around on a space station. But for those of you that aren't quite sure or just think that they're there for aesthetic purposes only, which granted for KSP that is what they're there for, but the actual functional use for them in real life is that they can be used to generate artificial gravity using centripetal force. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the actual spin speed we set and the mathematics behind getting this set up to work realistically during the actual ascent into low carbon orbit itself because as you can see the mass of this station is massive and due to its complexity and overall design it would be it makes more sense to just do it all in one launch. So during the launch, which will take a while, I'm going to go over the mathematics and calculations I had to do behind the scenes when I was setting up the rotors for this thing. For now, we can just talk about the rest of the build. Um, there, it, oh, Now it's gone to the vehicle assembly building. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have a huge amount of dry mass. And as you can see, it's a fairly like complicated structure so we're going to need to make sure it's all strutted together to make sure it doesn't all wobble apart in flight i couldn't rely on auto strut because auto strut freaks out and summons the kraken when you have you know clipped together parts like those rings are so and even then it took probably about six or seven attempts to get this thing into orbit without the rings glitching out and hitting the fairings and exploding the whole ship so it was Actually, one of the more difficult flights I've ever done, not out of difficulty itself, but rather, you know, trying to appease the deep space Kraken, which hopefully will uh, at least be somewhat gimped by Kerbal Space Program 2's improvements, but really, who knows? But I'm hoping the Kraken is far less apparent in that game. But then again, I guess 
uh, maybe I'm being a bit exploitative of Kerbal Space Program's building tools here. Maybe I don't think the intention of this game was to actually build rockets of this complexity. This is just sort of the end game that, you know, freaks like me want to go and try and push the game to its limits. So maybe it's not that high on their priority list, but it would be nice to be able to <laughs> build ships and not have to worry about collision glitches and all that stuff. So, yeah, massive rocket here. You can see the core is built from those Saturn V parts from the other uh, DLC pack, the Making History Parts pack. And then it's actually kind of flanked by two mammoth boosters. And, you know, those fuel tanks were formerly the biggest fuel tanks in the game. And now they pale in comparison to the size of those new ones there. Now, actually, what I did was I tried launching this to see if our thrust to weight ratio was good enough. And as you can see, it was not. So I went back to the vehicle assembly building and replaced the uh, lower engines there with a few more. Uh, the Mammoth engine is basically comprised of four vector engines. So I bumped it up to seven vector engines per side, and that provided enough TWR. Yes, I could have just looked at the thrust to weight ratio uh, readouts in the, in the vehicle assembly building before trying to launch it, but that's part of the fun, you know, seeing, ro seeing if rockets can get off the ground without actually checking it yourself first. Now here you can see we're building a truss structure just here out of these girders, just because we want to be able to strut the top ring as well, because after about, I've, I've cut it out, but after about three or four attempts of flying and constantly having the rings shake themselves apart, I decided to add in these girders to try and strengthen the thing somewhat. The problem with the rings is that you can't strut them to the rest of the station itself, which is what, a, what, what I would have done in an ideal world, because once you fire up the rotors, the struts would hold them in place. So the struts have to be attached to detachable pieces. I guess I could have had some sort of decoupler set up with struts on the upper part of the ship, but this was just, for me at least, I thought this was the easier solution to go with. So that's what those girder parts are for. But with the girders in place, we can just strut this whole thing up like there ain't no tomorrow to make sure it's not going to fall apart. This is actually the second attempt of me launching this ring station because the first time one of the struts went rogue and it ended up attaching itself from one of the hitchhiker storage bays to one of the rings so the ring couldn't rotate. I found that out after getting it all the way into space and was happy with the video finished and then discovered that the station didn't work. So that was a big oof moment at 9 o'clock last night. <laughs> But it's all done now, and we can watch the launch that actually went well now. Now here we have a beautiful ground shot, courtesy of the mod Camera Tools, which is part of BD Armory, guys. Stop asking me where he down no Camera Tools, you get it from BD Armory. Sorry, unrelated, unrelated tangent there. And we can watch this thick boy soar off into the air at blazing speed, kind of, not really. It's a, it's a very slow launch. We will pick up speed very gradually, and worry not, I will not be playing the entire launch back in real-time speed. Just the initial kind of lift-off to give you a sense of acceleration for this payload here. Uh, when we come back, we'll be going, you know, at a, at a at a faster playback rate. Here it is here, that, that cutaway there. <laughs> One thing that you may not have quite noticed in the vehicle assembly building, but is worth mentioning, is that the side boosters are connected to the main kind of stage via a fuel line so that they're the only tanks that are draining fuel at the moment. The main core is not losing any fuel. So the moment we attach the side boosters, we will still have a fully fueled rocket, which is the most efficient way of flying a rocket like this. But now the flight is underway. There's not much for me to really talk about that I haven't already discussed at great length in previous videos about the launching of rockets. So I can go ahead and talk about what I was going to say earlier, which was uh, the actual kind of calculations behind getting the gravity rings to work in a realistic way. So, we have our two habitat rings. We need to work out if they will provide a comfortable living space. When it comes to the subject of creating an artificial gravity environment, there are four components for our rotating ring that we need to consider. The radius of the ring, the centripetal acceleration of the ring, i.e. the gravity level, the angular velocity, i.e. the spin speed, of the ring, and the tangential velocity, i.e. the rim speed. For the purposes of this video, I'm just going to ignore the tangential velocity for a second and just focus on those first three values. We can actually work out the radius of this station by stacking pieces of known size against the station's rotating arms, and we can work out its radius from the centre of rotation as 6.875 metres. The other fixed number in our equation is the centripetal acceleration, which needs to be about 1g in order to emulate Kerbin's surface gravity. So we've got our two fixed values here. So the number we need to figure out is the angular velocity, which is the spin speed, so we can set our rotor to an appropriate RPM. 
Using some simple mathematics, we can calculate that in order to create a 1G gravity environment, our RPM needs to be set to 11 rotations per minute. I unfortunately learned the hard way that KSP can only do uh, divisions of 5, so I went with 10 RPM to get it as close as possible. So there we have it, an excellent rotating ring for NASA and SpaceX to copy and build themselves. Because we've got the 1G environment, we've got the 1G environment, <laughs> except no. For the purposes of this craft, I only focused on that one thing, having the ring create a 1G environment. However, it's not just the gravity that needs to be exact for a human-rated space station. The radius of the ring, angular velocity, and the tangential velocity are also things that must be considered as well. For example, a radius that is too small will create too great a disparity in the speed of your feet versus the speed of your head, therefore resulting in quite a big difference in gravity at your head and feet. The radius of this craft in particular would be far too small for a human, you know. A human standing up in those rings, their head would be rotating much faster than the feet. In an ideal scenario, the radius needs to be bigger, much bigger. Uh, ideally, the bigger the radius, the better, so my station's radius is really no good for humans. Secondly, the angular velocity, as in the RPM, needs to be optimised. Constant habitat rotation can lead to motion sickness, dizziness and nausea. A 1977 study by Grabiel found that 10 RPM was too high, so we're a bit in the, in the woods there, but 5.4 RPM was a good upper limit for maximum rotation speed. But that being said, a 2003 paper by Lackner and Dizio found that sensory motor adaptation to 10 RPM can be achieved if astronauts make constant repetitive movements, as this repetition of motion allows the nervous system to make the necessary adaptations to overcome the symptoms of the rotation. So I guess we're kind of alright in that regard. We have a rotation speed of 10, so maybe, maybe we might be alright there. But really, it would ideally be a bit lower than that. There is also the matter of the tangential velocity, which I didn't talk about already. But the tangential velocity is the speed of the ring's rim itself. And we can work out the tangential velocity for our station here. Now a spin rate of 11 RPM with a 6.875 meter radius will result in a tangential velocity of around 7.92 meters per second. It is difficult to know if this would be a good speed or not for a human. A paper by Stone in 1973 suggests that an artificial gravity ring should have a tangential velocity of about 10 meters per second for optimal conditions, so we've kind of undershot things there. However, a 1969 paper by Gordon and Gervais, as well as a study in 1985 by Kramer, proposed that uh, the tangential velocity need only be 7 meters per second, so we're kind of all right there. However, to further complicate things, in 1962, Hill and Schnitzer suggested a tangential velocity target of only 6 meters per second. So clearly, some more research is needed before we can all come to an agreement regarding the tangential velocity, but if we take the average of all of those studies I just listed, we have a mean value of 7.5 meters per second. So, we, we, we've got one of 7.92. So there we are. While our radius and angular velocity are a bit off target for humans, the gravity and tangential velocity are pretty much spot on, and 2 out of 4 ain't bad, especially considering that kerbals are much shorter than humans, so they can probably tolerate a smaller radius and a higher spin speed anyway. So while I'm not happy with this thing as a human-rated station, I am more than satisfied with it as a kerbal habitat, at least as a preliminary experiment. Maybe that can be the purpose of this station. Hey! It can be a study in deciding if kerbals are capable of living comfortably in a station like this. One might argue that it would have been cheaper and easier and j overall just more sensible to do these tests on the ground first before spending hundreds of millions of currency <laughs> sending this thing into orbit. But, you know, the Kerbals, they've not got much to do. They've got a lot of free time. They, they, they just, they like doing things the hands on. And look at that, I managed to talk through the entire ascent and we are now in a stable orbit. Obviously we don't want to leave that booster stage stuck in space as well, so I'm just detaching it here using the Separatrons. And it's actually got some probe cores, reaction wheels and batteries on board so it can go ahead, deorbit itself and land as well. Because it's got the Rhino engine powering it, I couldn't make any landing gear long enough to kind of enable it to land on land, so we're going to be doing like a soft touchdown in the ocean. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We need to make sure that the rings can actually spin. Uh, like I said earlier, this was the second attempt getting this thing into space, and it's getting quite late at this point, so I'm like, I'm not going to do anything now until I've established it's working. First time I did it, I did everything. So I splash landed the lower stage and everything, and did everything else, and then I realized that the station didn't work. But, as you can see, we have a beautiful 
rotation there. Now, it's not quite spinning at 10 RPM, like I said, but you've got to bear in mind that Kerbal Space Program's like frame rate is a bit of a limiting factor there. You can see it's not quite running at a very smooth 60, so the speed of the game is probably affecting the spin rate there. And for bits of this video, I'll be speeding up the footage or slowing it down or whatever. So don't don't base the RPM on what you're seeing on screen. I've set the actual RPM of the rotors themselves to be 10. So hopefully in universe, they're spinning at the right rate. Who knows? What I do know is that we need to sort out this booster that is stuck in orbit here. So all I'm going to do is aim for the ocean. Not much more to it other than that. So just going to point retrograde, fire up the Rhino engine. Now, while it didn't have that much Delta V when it was attached to the station, now it's lost basically all of its dry mass. We have a huge amount of fuel left into it, or huge amount of Delta V, I should say, left into it. We still have the same amount of fuel, but the Delta V is higher. So it's not going to be an issue in terms of being able to land this thing with enough fuel. We've got more than enough to do a safe easy peasy landing so i've got those air brakes as well to better facilitate the landing it was more they're more there to kind of keep this thing balanced and under control stop it uh, spinning around too wildly but it's pretty it's a pretty trivial thing to land to be honest so you can just i guess if you just watch the footage here you can kind of get a sense of what i'm doing you could probably land this thing on land to be honest but because it's kind of got a, it's kind of a tall structure and the top of it's all kind of bent and stuff it wouldn't be very stable, especially on a gimbaling engine like that. So I thought it'd be safer to land it on water, just because if it falls over in the water, the rest of it will get wet. If it falls over on land, there's probably going to be some explosions that we don't want. We want to be able to recover this, even though we're playing in sandbox mode, so it doesn't matter because it didn't cost us anything. Whatever. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to buy time so we can get back to the station itself. But uh, yeah, I guess I should say there we are. It's all splashed down. Everything looks nice. You could always press F3 as well to confirm that nothing was destroyed, but I'm going to trust my gut instinct uh, and just recover it. And there it is, all back in one piece. We can open the tracking station and get back to the uh, station that we just put in low carbon orbit. And there it is. So one annoying thing is that the rotors always turn themselves off when you're not controlling the ship. I probably should have bound their activation to an action group, but there you go. One thing that's annoying, I keep having to manually up the torque on my rotors once they're in flight. I can't seem to figure out how to change the torque in the vehicle assembly building. I'm sure I'm just missing something obvious. Maybe one of you guys can tell me. I mean, I could just look it up and just play around with it for longer than five minutes, but you know me, I'm a bit too lazy for that sort of thing. But I don't know. I think for all intents and purposes, it's fine. So we have our four big main Kerbals here because I wanted the best of the best piloting and controlling this thing on its launch because like i said it was a very difficult rocket to launch but that now puts them out of action they're stuck in space they're not gonna be able to do any more missions so at some point in the near future we'll probably do another mission to go and bring them back probably involving some kind of space station extension one thing one thing this is missing is it'd be nice to have some solar panels on board and it'd be nice to have some fuel tanks as well so it can serve as a sort of refueling point in space so i'll probably do a video in which we extend it possibly with a space shuttle because that's quite a cool thing to do or even with i don't know like a skylon style ssto haven't really decided yet but i would like to extend this station beyond what we have here but i think this is a good start the one thing I wanted to really focus on in this video was the rotating rings, and we've done a pretty good job there, I think. I'd like to think so anyway. In fact, whilst we're doing all these beauty shots, I totally forgot to mention something that I actually wrote down, and I'll have it on a piece of card in front of me, and then I just forgot. I was talking a lot about all of those studies and just the general calculation of artificial gravity environment. A huge help was Theodore W. Hall's artificial gravity website. He's basically did the literature review that I was summarizing to you guys in the commentary. So I'm going to put a link to that website in the description. It's also got a nice easy calculator for you to just punch in various numbers and it will tell you immediately if your gravity ring will be safe or not for humans. Obviously there's a you can be a little bit more liberal with Kerbals, but it's a pretty nice tool, actually. Very niche tool, but I was kind of surprised it exists. But it's very nice nonetheless. And it will say your your space station's angular velocity is too high, and this is why. It's pretty nice. Check it out. There's also links within that to all the studies that were mentioned as well. Um, but that's it. There is the station. A lovely shot of it spinning away peacefully above the surface of the planet there. I think... I'm happy to leave it there. I hope you guys enjoyed the space station. It's certainly kind of uh, one of my better, probably my best looking station. I hope you'll agree. On screen, I'm going to put an end card thing up as well. Uh, there it is. 
On the left is a link to uh, a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. On the right-hand side was just my most recent upload. There's also a link to check out at the Patreon and to subscribe if you'd like to. In the description, you'll find links to my merchandise, Instagram, Twitter, and Discord. But guys, thank you for watching and uh, goodbye.